Hi everyone, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Tian Wong. Uh, I'm a physician scientist, and in case you're wondering what's a physician scientist, I'll explain that to you in a little bit. But essentially, I'm a physician, I'm an eye doctor, so I see patients, I treat them for their eye disease, I try to save them from being blind. At the same time, I'm also a scientist. I study different aspects of eye disease with a hope of discovering new treatment for patients of the future. Now, how do we train doctors like myself? Have you ever wondered when you see doctors, how are they trained? How do they possess knowledge to treat you? So that's the topic of the conversation I have with you today. Now, when we look at how we train doctors, it's really almost a century ago with the Flexner Report, which is a very influential report, to put a scientific basis to medical student or doctor training. Now, I won't go into the details of the report, but I was one of the early medical students when I was training. This was my brother in the 1980s and 90s as a young doctor. I kind of was the experiment of the Flexner Report. Now, what is this Flexner Report? How do we train doctors? Essentially, it goes through a very simple phase. We go to a medical school, typically it is between five to eight years around the world, and we started learning normal, what is a normal liver, a normal heart, and then we start learning abnormal, what happens to a abnormal heart, an abnormal liver, what we call basic medicine. Then we start learning clinical medicine, whereby we start really looking at patients. What do they complain about? How do we make a diagnosis? What is the treatment plan for the patient in a very sequential way? Now then, are we doctors at that time? Far from it. In fact, we will have to go through a hospital training program called residency. And that's when we really started seeing patients, trying to make a judgment, treat, how to treat, don't treat, including even seeing patients that die. Then we become, after five to 15 years, specialists or doctors that you can trust with your symptoms and your illness. This is the Flexner Report and how medical students are trained. Is this what we're going to do for the future? I usually sometimes ask. And when I look at some of the young doctors that we have, and this is a typical ward in Singapore where I was uh, in the medical school and the hospital there. And I look at this young doctor that's come out and he's typing notes there, and they're saying, what relevance does those nice, sequential, normal, abnormal teaching have to do with me on this patient? I'm not even seeing the patient. I'm managing as part of my team. So we need to think, is this our medical student training of the future? This is the Tsinghua Beijing Chang'an Hospital where I practice as an eye doctor. You see one of the resident doctor there, busy on the phone because we have just seen a patient and we needed another opinion from a specialist from another department. And she's talking and wondering, is this what she needs to do? What has medical school taught her that is relevant for her sitting there with the phone? Do we know, is this the best way to train? And then you still need to look at other situation from the patient's perspective. This is a busy hospital whereby patients are getting treatment, drips for their illnesses. And you can see a worried looking man there saying, why does it have to be like this? It's a poor experience. Can't we do better for my family? Can we improve the quality of care and the service of the care? And this is me 
looking at a patient where we may not be able to really help the patient anymore. And I'm wondering, how am I going to help the patient? What does the patient really need from me? So with these thoughts, I'm going to share really three ways in which we should think about the future. What do you want the doctors in the future to be to treat you when you need to be treated? First, we need to look at what are the problems of the future. Second, we need to know what are the possible solutions to tackle these problems. Then, I will share you an exciting program we launched at Tsinghua, which is what we call the Tsinghua's new medical education curriculum that's modelled along these thoughts. Let's go into the beginning. What do we anticipate to be the healthcare problems of the future? We just went through a global pandemic. It's likely to come again. But besides pandemic, what are we really looking at that we are concerned about? They, they are aging populations, chronic disease like diabetes. 600 million people around the world have diabetes. Some of them will get mild eye diseases. Some of them will get more severe eye diseases. And some of them will come to me with blindness that I have to try to prevent or to try to treat. How do we tackle this problem? Because these diseases occur over 20, 30, 40 years. Big chronic disease problem. They are the pandemics of the future. Then we look at this patient again. We, of course, expect an accurate diagnosis. We expect that there is safety in the treatment. We expect that there is certainty in the treatment. But it's not enough. Patients would want other things. They would like hope. They would like kindness in the system. They would like there to be coordination. It's not a mess. These are problems that we have to solve. Then we now start thinking, what about all the research that's going on? Haven't we made significant scientific discoveries? Yes, they've occurred a lot in the university, including Tsinghua. But are they reaching our patients? What does it take to bridge this deep gulf between what we are saying in scientific discovery and what the patients are getting treatment. So these are significant challenges. We then look at, therefore, possible solutions. Now, the first thing I would say is, are we looking at this problem from the wrong way? I spend most of my time at tertiary advanced hospital, treating patients with drugs and surgery at, when they are blind. But should we look at it at preventing the disease? For example, if some of the patients could control their sugar level, maybe not have so much sugar drinks, if we are able to screen them, could they therefore be not needing to go to the hospital? Better still, let's look at the population level. If all of the population start exercising, being, thinking about their diet and their lifestyle, Maybe we prevent diabetes altogether. So future doctors must not need treatment at the tertiary hospital level, but they need to have a preventative medicine approach. Prevent disease better than treat late diseases. This is what future doctors must know. Then we looked at technology. This is artificial intelligence. A lot of you would be aware. There are significant developments over many years. Do we need all the knowledge that we use to teach? Could they be found by looking at the internet or by AI models? And therefore, do we need to teach our doctors to be comfortable and to be conversant with AI and digital technology? How can a doctor in the future not know what is artificial intelligence? So that's another thing that we need to prepare our doctors for the future. Now, how do we bring this gap that I've mentioned between scientific discovery and papers 
to the bedside or the clinical patients. We need to bring these two together and we need to glue them together with what I mentioned in the beginning, which is to create a new breed of doctors called the physician scientists. Doctors who are able to practice and those who can also create new solutions. Now, one of my mentors at Johns Hopkins was this doctor here, pointing to the diagram. And this doctor is an eye doctor who, in the 1980s, spent a lot of time in Indonesia. He was researching how a lack of vitamin A could lead to childhood blindness. So kids were getting blind because they were not getting vitamin A. And he went to Indonesia to study this problem. At that time, during his research, he found that many of the children that was in this clinical study did not come back to see him. And he wondered why. And he discovered that most of them that had vitamin A deficiency, lack of vitamin A, the children died. And therefore, he conducted a trial whereby he randomized some villagers to have vitamin A supplementation in their rice and those that were on normal diet. And he found that those with vitamin A supplementation had a 30% decline in childhood mortality. The graph that he's pointing to says, I could be a doctor, but because of my scientific research, I saved 100 million people over the last 20, 30 years. That's a physician scientist, identifying a problem, creating a solution, and vitamin A supplementation is now listed by WHO as one of the most cost-effective prevention in the world today. For that, he got the Lasker Award. Finally, I want to highlight this picture now. This picture shows me with a patient, and I want you to understand that we want our doctors to not just look and see, but to feel and touch. Many of our young doctors today forget that the patients in front of them are not just a disease, an entity, but a human being. And therefore, we must preserve the art in medicine. Now, having shared all these wonderful ideas, we say, how do we make it a reality in Tsinghua? We started a new education model whereby we laid the foundation of the art and the science and the clinical medicine in the program so that they are future ready. Now, what does it really mean? Now, I talked to you about a medical school. We launched two programs, an eight-year program, which we call an eight-year physician scientist program, and a graduate entry program whereby they come in after the first degree and have a four years of medical education as an MD program. And we hope that when they're in their residence here in the hospital, we will also support them in their lifelong learning by creating a centre for physician scientist development. This will therefore support them in their careers to be physician scientists. Now, the curriculum goes in an interesting way, giving choices to the students. They have foundation years with early clinical exposure. Then, they will have a research training either early or late, two years substantial enough to have a research project. Then they will have clinical training, whether it's early or late, depending on their preferences. On top of that, we created, as I said, the 4 plus 4 program, whereby they could come from any discipline, engineering, science, arts, because we want our doctors to have these kind of qualities, and they go through a four-year student program. And we hope to support them in the hospital with a centre for lifelong learning, a centre for physician scientist development in our hospital system to support them while they are training in the hospitals. These are our first batch of students last year, eight-year programme, and we are so pleased that we managed to get 67 of them. 
And these are our seven students that are in our graduate program. Now, out of these seven students, five of them came from an engineering background. So in the future, we hope that they will be our physician, scientists, engineers. They will be able to bring engineering science into the art of medicine in the future. So as I reflect on this curriculum, which we will see results maybe many years later, they hopefully will be future ready doctors. And as I interacted with them, I keep thinking, what am I teaching to them today to prepare them for tomorrow to be future ready doctors to take care of us, our families, and for generations to come. Thank you.